In this episode, you'll learn how to help design and designers inside an organization to succeed. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Michelle, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 151. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Michelle Walter, who's now the head of design operations at ANZ Bank. With Michelle, I talk about why so many organizations still make the mistake of hiring designers and then forgetting to set the right conditions for these designers to deliver the best work. Michelle and her design ops team are tasked with making sure this doesn't happen at ANZ. They help the organization to hire the right designers for the right job and then make sure that these designers are set up for success from the very get-go. As you'll hear in this conversation, creating these internal conditions has been a long journey that required a lot of patience and perseverance. Over the years, two key elements emerged that Michelle contributes to the success they are finding right now. A vibrant internal design community and a highly curated professional development program. If you stick around till the end of this conversation, you'll learn what it took to get this design community off the ground and really make it thrive and all the secrets behind this development program. If you enjoy exploring topics like this that help you to grow as a service design professional, make sure to click that subscribe button because we bring a new video every week or so. That about wraps it up for the intro. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Michelle Walter. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Mark, thanks for having me. Yeah, really excited uh, to have you on the show. Uh, all the way from Australia, uh, we'll learn a little bit more about where in Australia specifically, but we're on the opposite sides uh, of the world and time zone. So I'm happy that we were able to make this work. Um, Michelle, uh, the first thing I always start with is a brief introduction, uh, because I would love to know a little bit more about who you are, and I can imagine uh, the people who are listening to this episode as well. So, um, who are you and what do you do these days? Thank you. Um, so I am Michelle Walter. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I'm from Australia, so uh, quite far away from uh, where you are, Mark. Uh, I live in Melbourne. Uh, I was born here uh, and I, I, I guess um, I have two kids. Uh, I have a new puppy, as most people uh, did as part of the pandemic, bought a dog. Um, which is kind of like my third child, um, but she's great. Um, and being in Melbourne, I love coffee and food. Um, and now that uh, we're all out of our lockdowns, I'm enjoying uh, the freedoms that we have in this great city of ours. Um, at work, so I work for ANZ Bank. So we are one of the largest uh, uh, financial institutions in Australia. They say that we're one of the big four. Um, so there's three others that kind of compete in our space. Uh, and I head up design operations there. Uh, I've been there for seven years. Uh, I came in as a contractor. Um, I thought I'd be there for six months and I thought, this is great. I can kind of try before I buy. I'd never worked in a organi inside a, a large corporate before. Um, but uh, all these years later, I'm still there. Um, so I lead design operations, as I mentioned, and I uh, support, we have 210 designers um, that work right across our business. Um, so a, quite a large community, probably one of the largest in Australia. Um, when I started, we were 11 designers. Um, so what's been really interesting about joining a bank is seeing, uh, I guess, the, the progression and the maturity um, grow in terms of design, um, our, our capability, and certainly our community grow over those years. So there's never a dull moment, uh, I have to say, when it comes to embedding design. Mm, awesome. So. Uh... This is going to be a great episode and it's really um, 
surprising to me that I've been trying to get somebody from the design ops community on the show uh, for quite a while, and it's, somehow it's been very challenging. Uh, I don't know why, because the design ops community seems to be thriving as well. Uh, so I'm happy that uh, you are sort of the uh, the first one to uh, create bridges between uh, the service design show community and design ops. I think there's a lot of overlap, and uh, we definitely should be. Uh, having more conversations together. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say, that's really interesting because I would say um, the design ops community is absolutely growing um, and it's probably been around for as, as kind of a, a discipline for probably about five to seven years. But I think what's really interesting about um, what we do in design ops is uh, if I go back kind of before it was uh, kind of named as a discipline, uh, you know, there were lots of people uh, and designers in particular, studio managers, producers um, who, who were playing a similar kind of role where we're really there to support and enable uh, design to thrive within companies. Um, we build, you know, programs and frameworks to really drive efficiencies uh, and we really look at engagement. Um, so I guess though with those factors, they've really been around for a while, um, but now it's nice. We can label ourselves as yeah. design operations and uh, we're really starting to build a global a global community around that. Mm, yeah, and um, it's great because now you can sort of uh, connect with each other, expand the field, expand the practice. And like I said, I think there's so much overlap and synergy between service design and design ops, but uh, I'm sure we'll get into that uh, a bit later. Yeah. Um, Michelle, um, we also have a rapid fire question round uh, for which right. you haven't prepared, I hope. Uh, <laughs> you get 60 seconds to answer these questions. Um, so are you ready? Go for it. All right. What was your first job? Um, my first job was working at a bakery. Got it. Um, what's always in your fridge? Sliced cheese. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could rent, recommend one a book, which book would it be? Um, the Art of Gathering by mm. uh, Priya Parker. It is yep. a must read. Got it. Next to me. Um, if you oh. could work from one place in the world, anywhere, uh, which place would you pick? Um, my home office in Melbourne. Okay, sounds good. And the final question is, um, I'm curious uh, if you recall the first time you heard about service design. Yeah, when I joined ANZ. Mm. Yep. And what was the um, story? I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't know much about service design. My background was more in digital design and graphic design. Um, and then uh, I remember uh, when we were starting to really build the team and build uh, the different capabilities within the team. When I first joined ANZ, uh, I got a job description that said service designer. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> um, and what was really interesting is that uh, I learned pretty quickly that, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been around for a while and a lot of the uh, opportunities or problems that service designers solve are really similar to what we do in operations. Mm. Um, thinking about all the different experiences and all the different opportunities and touch points along the way. And yeah, it, it really resonated. Um, and I was like, oh, I knew about this for a while. But again, it, it hadn't sort of been labeled in my own world. So it was nice to, to learn about that from, from very early on when we started recruiting designers within ANZ. Mm, cool. Um, so uh, in preparation for our talk, uh, you mentioned, and I'm going to get my notes here, um, let's talk about uh, growing, nurturing, and inspiring designers within a large, complex organization like a bank, yep. correct? Correct. I love Just that. Just a small topic. Yeah, Just a small, small topic. topic. <laughs> Um, and there is so much to unpack here because I think one of the big challenges is, isn't per se getting designers into an organization is actually keeping them inside the organization, which doesn't have a strong design heritage. Uh, so, um, you apparently have some ideas on how to do that and, uh, I'd love to learn more, but, uh, let's rewind the tape a little bit and, uh, go back to how did you get started with this. What yep. is your story? What is your journey? 
Great. Um, so if I cast my mind back, it was probably about four years ago. And uh, I, I'd started in, um, I had a new boss and a, a pretty much a new structure um, for design operations and thinking about how we were going to continue to scale design at ANZ. Sort of newish, newish remit, um, new manager, um, and I guess one of the things that we wanted to do really early on was understand what challenges there were for our designers and what and really how we turned those challenges into opportunities. So it was all great designers. Uh, we ran a series of interviews. Um, we sent out a survey, um, and we really started with discovery. And one of the really early insights that we gathered was. Um, there was really murky and, and really unclear um, career progression, um, career pathways um, for our designers, and they really didn't know how ANZ were going to support them on, on kind of their growth and development. So it was almost like this, this golden nugget <laughs> that was given to, to us, um, and it was really, it was really clear, and, and quite a few of our designers were really passionate about um, working for an organisation that truly supported them and nurtured them and, and helped them help them grow. Um, so we took this, I guess, what seemed like a relatively small idea. Um, we developed a how might we statement about really focusing on um, supporting our designers on their career aspirations and we spun up a project. Um, you know, we were good citizens, we wrote a brief, um, we thought about our stakeholders um, and really from the get-go, um, we we found the right sponsor and mm. luckily it was our chief design officer um, and he was 100% on board with the program and I guess the brief that we were looking um, to develop. So we worked really closely, we formed a small team and we really learned by doing, I have to say, we ran workshops, um, we brought our design leadership together. Um, and one of the one of the things that came out of that was there was a real um, gap or a black hole around skills. So whilst I guess the North Star was thinking about, you know, supporting our designers career aspiration, you know, there was the kind of the short to medium term opportunity, which was really around defining skills. Our designers didn't know what skills they needed. Um, so whether they were, I guess, the more softer skills or the more technical skills um, that would help them uh, progress in their career. Mm. Um, so we really love this idea around skills. Um, and we basically thought, well, what are the ways that designers could learn about these skills? Um, and we came up with this idea of a workbook. I love using props. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the finished product. Um, so we published a book, um, which is all around skills um, that our designers need um, and what that looks like across all the different levels. So this is one about inclusive design. So we describe the skill, um, why it's important to design, and then some of the activities um, and, and expectations that we would um, expect of our designers for each of those skills. So we set an ambitious goal to, to publish a book and about eight months later we did that, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, I've never published a book before, um, so it is for our internal audiences. Um, and we really we really treated it as a, as a prototype. So even though it's a beautifully published book, um, we're very much still, again, still are to this day, um, operating in that beta mindset, um, really is a way to, to test and learn whether this idea of skills and, and designers understanding what skills they have now and what skills they need um, and how ANZ can support them um, to, I guess, grow mastery in those skills were the three things that we will really lay the foundation of, of uh this kind of small project that <laughs> turned into quite a large run um, that we've really been focusing on for the last sort of three to four years. Mm. All right, let's wrap up the episode. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> there was uh, there, there was an interesting journey, um, <laughs> and there's uh, again so much that we can dive into. Um, so this gives a pretty uh, good high level uh, idea of uh, what you've been doing recently, but I, I still want to go one step back. Oh. And uh, that's the moment that you, that somebody within the organization came up with the idea that, hey, we might need to ask our designers what they need. Like, can you take us back to that moment? Because in a lot of organizations, 
this doesn't happen? Like, where did this initial question come from? Um, that's a really great question. So, I, you know, I feel like the question came from just not knowing, have a, having a real sense of what our designers needed. To be honest, it came from uh, curiosity. Um, it came from a, a, an environment where, you know, a lot of our designers were new. Um, a lot of them had transitioned from other organisations that were looking at um, engagement and retention and learning programs um, much more maturely than, than we were. And we really had nothing. Um, we had a lot of, I guess, more um, generic frameworks that ANZ have developed, which absolutely served a purpose for the broader community. But there was nothing really that spoke to designers in a language that they understood that was easily accessible and also designed for um, accessibility in mind as well. So I guess it was just a, a bit of a blank canvas. Um, mm. So it was definitely a, a need with, um, yeah, a gap in, in what we were seeing in terms of what we could offer um, our designers. I guess the other point is it became a really important um, part of our recruitment strategy. Um, we were scaling design really we were scaling design really quickly and we needed designers on the ground. And whilst we spoke about all the great benefits of you know working for an organization such as ours, we sort of really needed the hook um, and what was going to make us different to, the startup down the road or the financial institution across the road, um, you know, and the market's still really tough today. So I guess we were also looking at, um, yeah, just a bit of a hook to to help differentiate us when we, when we were positioning us mm. uh, as a bank to say, mm. why A and Z, not someone else? Yeah. So uh, um, that's sort of the thing I was, I was curious about because, um, so identifying the gap, that's one thing, but if there is no uh, pain or there are no consequences, then uh, there is little uh, motivation to actually act upon this. But from what I'm getting from your story, like when you want to scale design, you need to have a place that's attractive and that mm, designers actually want to work with. And you need to, like you said, uh, some kind of edge over your competitors who are also hiring designers and that's what i'm getting from your story one of the things yeah. that drove this initiative absolutely and one of the things that still holds true today is um when we screen candidates when we um when we talk to them when we have interviews um referencing the program is a really important part of selling design um you know we we run lots of events uh we have you know we focus a lot on community building we focus a lot on tooling to to help with efficiencies with our um, designers but at the end of the day i think one thing that i've learned is that our designers want to feel like the organization generally cares about them mm -hmm. and i guess for us it was um a really effective way to say we care right from you know when we're interviewing designers as that kind of key differentiator but really delivering on on that promise um via this program and, and other initiatives that we that we do around um growth and development how would you describe the situation sort of uh before the program and i'm uh, especially uh curious to the like what was the expectation of the organization when hiring designers because apparently there were designers prior to this and yep. they were sort of put into this huge complex machine what was the expectation back then uh, when hiring designers um that's a really great question so uh pre the program and i guess pre um, my time um in design operations because one of the things that we do is is support the recruitment and onboarding of designers um it was a bit of a wild west i have to say we you know we understood that the business wanted to hire designers um but it was kind of every man for themselves. Um, and we had a lot of hiring managers that didn't necessarily come from design who wanted the help from the organization, but we just didn't have the expertise. We didn't even really have an interview guide um, that really spoke to simple things like a portfolio presentation. Designers should present their portfolio or case studies. Um, so it was really sort of everyone to themselves. And I guess the the opportunity that we saw in that was to streamline the process, um, 
you know, build, you know, a, a proper interview guide. But really the outcome was quality. So we had, you know, quality designers that were fit for purpose. So again, to answer your question, going back, um, we had designers placed in the wrong team. We had designers placed in teams that had hiring managers that for no fault of their own thought that they understood what they were hiring for um, and then landed with someone completely different. Mm. Um, so obviously education was a really big part of what we, you know, what we focused on um, when we were looking at, I guess, a new way of recruiting designers and then speaking in a language that not only we understood but non-designers as well. There is, uh, it makes a lot of business sense to actually do this and streamline this process, make it more efficient, uh, optimize it, make sure that the right match is there. But I think yeah. the most important part is probably that you're um, sort of making sure that there is less human uh, suffering because when you get hired on the wrong team or um, for the wrong position, like designers burn out and they leave they get frustrated so i think that's yeah. the that's the biggest win already what i'm hearing from your story yeah absolutely and um we take a lot of time um when we're looking through cvs um when we're writing job descriptions uh interview process um particularly um if it's for a more senior role our chief design officer participates in interviews. So we have gone from a, a space where, um, yeah, it was it was a bit of an unknown territory and, you know, you would go on our intranet and hope that you would find uh, some kind of interview guide um, or some kind of framework that you could leverage. And we've moved to a place where uh, we have one source of truth, so everything is on our design playbook. You know, we have our chief design officer involved um, and who, who runs a pretty uh, rigorous interview um, with a more, more leadership or senior positions. Um, and we have a whole onboarding program as well uh, off the back of that. So um, an incredible amount of efficiencies. Um, but to be honest, it took, it, it took years to to sort of get it right um, mm -hmm. and we're still learning the the market is incredibly challenging at the moment and the way designers uh, even want to be interviewed is different i mean you you look at a screen um, it might be more panel style interviews um, so how do you make it inspiring and engaging for them when you know when they're potentially and you're potentially looking at a screen all day mm. um, so yeah lots of lots of opportunities um, particularly around the, the recruitment space for us mm. but you're absolutely right if and and we had this very much early on um hiring hiring the you know the the wrong person or for the wrong role um caused a lot of reputational damage as well um and it and you go back to square one so you have them uh, join you've, you've invested weeks of time um and then they land and either they're not happy or the hiring manager um, there's a misalignment there and then they leave and then you've got to kind of go back again, yep. um, which is pretty tiring. Yeah. Yep. So we just yep. try as best we can to set A and Z up and the designer up for success. Um, mm. And that that takes time, but we're happy to to invest in that prior to prior to them joining. Well, like not investing that time, uh, the alternative is what you just described even worse. So it's, uh, yep. right. Um, I'm curious uh, to hear about your practical, uh, what is it, the, the, the things that you have found that work for you. And we, you've mentioned the program already a few times. Sounds like something very mystical, but uh, I know it's very tangible. So maybe we can dive into, and I know that you have two stories, uh, into the things that you're doing today to grow, nurture, and inspire the uh, designers within ANZ. Um, so I'll probably talk about my, the second one first. Um, so again, you know, thinking about the opportunities as we were scaling design, building a community was really important. So we are an organisation of 45,000 people. So 210 designers is relatively small. Um, so feeling a sense of connection and belonging, particularly for a creative community, was a huge opportunity for, for design ops. And it's still something that we continue to work on um, even, even to this day. So how do we foster that, um, particularly with so many of us being online? And, and we do have 
uh, I guess we are a global community, so we have um, teams in New Zealand and also in India. So uh, focusing on that sense of feeling connected, um, yeah, is is really important. Um, so a couple of things that um, we tried really early on um, was this notion of uh, events and experiences. Um, so we essentially have three signature events um, that we run uh, throughout the year to really foster that um, sense of community. They all are now done online, um, which is great because it means that anyone can dial in at any time. Um, I have to say that, you know, booking a meeting room and catering and all that kind of, all those kinds of things um, always took extra work. Um, but uh, yeah, I think being online has definitely has, has, has it has its advantages. Um, so we run events um, and the three events we run really focus on three sort of different aspects of building community. Uh, the first one is uh, we call it our design monthly meetup um, and that is a, essentially a, an event that we run on the last Thursday of each month where we scour LinkedIn and our networks to try and find um, inspiring speakers. Um, we have a range of topics uh, it could be about design, it could be about innovation, um, accessibility, uh, leadership. Uh, we really make the topics quite broad, um, but it's a really great way to bring our community together um, for an hour where they'll come to learn, walk away with something and, and as I mentioned, feel inspired. So that, that's kind of our first event that we run. Um, we also run a town hall, um, which is our, uh, I guess, an all hands. Um, and that's a really great way to not only get organisational updates, but also a bit of a um, showcase uh, as well to see what other teams are doing. Um, whilst we have a lot of designers in our community, getting visibility on what everyone's working on can be incredibly challenging, I have to say. And, and there can be a lot of duplication of work um, or work that other teams could potentially leverage. Um, so a really great way to, to kind of foster the work, um, create more conversation around the work. Um, so, so that's a really great event and we run those every quarter. Um, and we've also just started uh, an event series called Navigating ANZ. Um, so that is part of our learning program. And Navigating ANZ is an awesome new series, also run each month, that helps our designers connect with other teams across the organisation. Really the enablement team, so teams from finance, um, personalisation, marketing, um, group strategy, uh, to foster more connections with those teams um, and really understanding as a designer how you can work more effectively with those teams because design shouldn't work in a, in a silo. Um, but uh, I guess what we're trying to do with that series is just really uncover who are the teams or who are the true enablers of design and how can we work with them better. So they're kind of the three the three uh, events and experiences that we run. Um, for, for all of our events, um, I say they're like a stage show. We uh, plan them, we script them, we uh, do a, a lot of preparation, we prototype them, we even have a dress rehearsal um, uh, just to make sure that everything kind of works well on the day. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I've, I fully buy, uh, buy in into the idea of communities and I think it's super important uh, and um, super valuable. I think that's the way uh, sort of any professional who's beyond the junior stage grows and learns. Now. The thing that you described, and uh, you also mentioned it, uh, it's a lot of work. It doesn't happen organically. And I think that's one of the things that I've been seeing with communities that people sort of, it's very reliant on volunteers, but it sounds like you have a very structured and professional, dedicated team um, doing this, right? Yep. That's a great observation, Mark. It's um it's been years in in the in the works. Um, so I have to say that when we when we thought about this idea of events events and experiences, um, they started really small. Um, there was no script. 
um, things were going wrong all the time um, and we just kind of wing it, um, which I think is fine to a point. Um, but when you're lo- talking to a much larger audience, you want to keep it interesting. Um, it potentially becomes more complex. Um, we try and plan things three months ahead so people know that it's coming up and, and they can a- allow time in their diary to turn up. Um, yeah, it does. It does require more preparation. Um, but I have to say that yes, uh, Design Ops runs a lot of those initiatives. It really ties to uh, closely to our engagement. Um, we have really incredible engagement scores, and I'd love to attribute our events and experiences that drive that drive those positive scores. Um, but we're still learning. Some of our events don't work so well. Um, sometimes we get a lot of acceptances, and then on the day people get clashes or different priorities or yeah so um we but look i think that you know if we can get 100 to 200 people on a call um that's a pretty good success metric for us um but probably the biggest win is um referrals so uh, if our designers share the events with other people in their team and they they're gaining interest um that's that's a really great um success measure for us. Um, A really great story that just happened today um, that I would love to share, our Navigating ANZ series uh, as we've just started, so connecting designers with other teams across our organisation. We've seen a really great opportunity to uh, work with our friends in uh, HR or talent and culture, as we call it, who's running a similar speaker series. So trying to not duplicate, it looks like we're going to come together and collaborate on more of a um, enterprise wide series that really started from design uh, and started from, um, I guess, a small idea that we thought uh, could really have a lot of leverage and benefit other teams, not just designers. So um, that that's a really great um, that's a really great win for us because um, mm. we don't always want to operate just with designers. Um, I mean, that's great. And obviously our primary focus I- is our community. But if we can build a broader community outside of design, that's that's also a win too. Awesome that it's um, that it's still growing and that you are getting support for this. I'm um, I- I'm curious if if you can recall, like was it um, uh, an organic growth all the way, uh, starting from a sm- something small, done based probably on a voluntary basis, or was there like a pivotal moment that you thought, well, okay, sort of. Uh, this is becoming so big. Now we need to get dedicated people. We need to get a sponsor. Yep. Or wh- how did how did this evolution go? Um, it really started as small. It really started as a small. Well, a lot of our ideas in design operations, I have to say, start as this kind of little flicker that burns, like and, and curiosity. Why don't we try this? Or what about that? Or you know, and then it turns into something bigger. Like, why don't we publish a book? And um, why don't we, you know, build a website um, that looks at, you know, mapping skills? So um, for the events, it was it was really similar. Um, but I guess one of the things that we always focused on um, it really early on was engagement and thinking about, you know, in, in, retention and, and inspiration. They're kind of the three words that um, we've always thought about over the years. Um, but it definitely started off really small. Um, and it, I guess the interest just grew. Um, and one of the things as well is it's, if you put the time in people's diary and it's the same time roundabout each month um, the same cadence the same formula it just kind of sticks people know that it's coming up they get excited about it I mean we used to change the day this is kind of um, a really good example so early on we had it on a Thursday then we changed it to Friday afternoon and then it was on a Monday and one of the pieces of feedback was I really it was nice having it on a Thursday. You know, I knew that Thursday at one o'clock was going to be our design monthly meetup. Um, and so we kind of took that. It was like, oh, okay, well, we don't really need to shuffle the time and we'll just make it work. So those kind of m- micro ideas, but turn into like the big ideas really helped sort of set the rhythm and it helped with planning. It helped with all the prep. It helped with line up, lining up our speakers. Um, but from a designer's perspective, they always knew it was there. Mm -hmm. And it was just that consistency. And I think in a world where so many of their calendars are 
double booked with meetings and stand-ups and, you know, design reviews. It was really nice to have something just consistent that they just didn't need to think about. And and uh, this is a great example. And uh, I'm sort of in a similar situation running a community for in-house service designers where um, a lot of the things that um, make these events work and these communities work, they seem so natural, like having a fixed yeah. time. But they are done by design. They are very deliberate. And I think um, you sort of have to have someone or a team thinking about this, designing this experience, because it doesn't happen naturally. Uh, it, it It's designed. Like, it's, again, it's it's a deliberate Absolutely. act. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's really interesting about designing the experiences. I mean, that's absolutely one of our principles. And that's why we spend so much time in the prepping and planning is that we try and think about all the interactions, um, you know, and, and building the momentum for, for those events and experiences. Um, it's really interesting. One of the questions that I was asked just recently, uh, I was in an internal workshop and there were different people from across the organisation looking at their own capability programs, so looking at skills and mastery. And one of the questions that was asked to the group from someone quite senior was, um, talk us through some of the successes around your program or the different programs that you offer to your different communities. And one of the things that I reflected on was exactly what you said. We design the experiences. So when we think about learning and development, when we think about growth opportunities, everything is by design. Um, we think about, you know, the needs of our designers. We think about the needs of the business um, and we bring those two together um, to really think about, you know, what 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 is those experiences? What are those interactions? What are our success measures? Um, and what are we going to do next? So that's something really important, um, particularly for design ops um, and what we do and and what what my team does. Um, and yeah, I think that's being really intentional about where you're at and and the problem, and then and then thinking about how you're going to deliver it, and yeah, celebrating those wins, losses, and learnings. I guess is really important as well when we think about that end-to-end -end experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. And like you said, it can start out small organically and just winging it, but really quickly you <laughs> sort of see that this needs love, time, attention yeah. to take it to the yeah. next level. So, okay. Community. Uh, awesome to hear that it's uh, it's it's a vibrant community and that they are engaged and that it's still growing. I would love to also hear a little bit about your second uh, adventure. Okay, so the, um, the second one was really around uh, our learning program. Um, so one of the things that I guess I wanted to share uh, a little bit about that experience, just to just to build on what we were talking about earlier. So uh, the program has been running for just over three years now. And uh, one of the things that we did early on was build the toolkit. So we said, okay, here's the thing that we need to build um, to really give designers that understanding of skills. And we built some tools and frameworks around that. Um, and again, thinking about the experience or, or, or running any great design project, um, we gathered lots of feedback along the way. And one of the things that our designers shared with us actually really early on um, was kind of thanks for telling me or showing me what skills I need, but how is ANZ going to help me, help me grow in those skills um, and really improve my mastery? Like, what does that look like? Um, so again, another kind of golden nugget. And we took that as an opportunity to build our skills learning program. Um, and yep, that's been running for about three years. It started off as a pilot. I'd love to say it was a small pilot, but it wasn't such a small pilot in the end. Um, but it was this kind of simple idea where um, we did a whole bunch of research around, um, well, what are, what are sort of the facilitated workshops? What are the expert coaches out there? Um, what's some online learning that we could offer to our designers? curate it and bring it all together as part of this skills learning program. And one of the problems that we were solving back then was um, our designers didn't know where to go. So we said, right, well, if you want to upskill in storytelling, there's lots of courses on LinkedIn or go to this conference or, you know, find a mentor. 
but they just sort of hit a wall. Um, so a great example, when you type in adaptive leadership on LinkedIn Learning, which I think is a really great platform, I think you get 16,000 you know, the 16,000 modules that you can look at. So really overwhelming for our designers and then they become disengaged. It's too hard. Um, so fast forward, uh, we built this program um, to make it really easy for our designers to sign up. So we offer a whole lot of uh, yeah, curated uh, learning experiences, we call them, um, and they're facilitated by external uh, coaches and educators from right across the world. So Mark, you might be interested in facilitation. Um, well, you'd go to our website, um, which is an internally hosted website, and we'd offer two to three courses um, and some complimentary coaching that can help you upskill in facilitation. So it's a year long program. It's a lot of work. Um, we have an incredible volunteer group or working group as we call them. They help pull together the program. Um, and yeah, and we, and we run it, we run it um, every year. Um, so that's kind of a nice compliment. So I guess when we think about growth and development at ANZ, we have the what, which is the the, the workbook and um, some some frameworks that we've put in place, but the learning program that we've put forward is really the how. It's really how we're going to support you um, to grow those skills um, and how you can progress further in in your career by by learning new skills or yeah um, yeah just developing more in the skills that you're cho choosing to focus on. Mm. Super interesting. And I can totally imagine overwhelm and then people getting disengaged. Um, what would you, uh, I, I feel that you, you, um, you experienced this program as a, as a big success. What, what do you think is the thing that attributes most to its success in the form that it is right now? I love this question. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. Uh, it sounds really easy to say, but in organisations, I know it's quite hard to do. Find your sponsor really early on. Um, they're going to be the person, um, or might be a few sponsors, that are really going to um, contribute to the program, help advocate for the program, and uh, help fund the program in a lot of ways. One of the things that we did really well was take the time to find who the right sponsor was. In this case, it wasn't someone from our human resources or our talent and culture department. It was actually our chief design officer, who still yeah. is who's still our sponsor today. Can, can you share a bit more about that? Because like you said, like saying find a sponsor, or find the right sponsor, it's easy to say, it's hard to do. Like, yep. how did your journey go? What did you do? How did yep. you find a sponsor? Um, so the first step was we went to our HR department and said, we're thinking about this idea. Um, we want to leverage a lot of the work that ANZ has done around growth and development, but we want to um, make it more relevant and I guess more bespoke um, for our designers. And they basically said, great idea. Um, you just basically need to go and do it yourself. Um, but very respectfully, they said, you know, we solve um, these kinds of uh, problems or look at opportunities more enterprise wide. And there really wasn't the appetite um, to look at something specifically for design. We, we were and still are quite a small community, uh, relatively speaking. But I think what ANZ do well is um, they rely on, uh, I guess, community leads like myself uh, to build um, these kinds of programs. And there's benefits to that is I understand the community more, I understand what they need more, um, and, you know, can really build something that would resonate with them. So something a bit more creative um, and something a little bit more engaging. Uh, what they what they offer, again, is, is really to stretch across many roles and across the organisation. Um, so there really wasn't that appetite back then um, to build something specifically for us. Um, so I, I, I went to the Chief Design Officer and I said, look, uh, I was pretty honest and I said, we have this idea. Um, we just want to run a test and learn. Uh, we want to build a prototype pretty quickly, and uh, but we need a sponsor. Um, would you sponsor it? And at the time, we didn't really talk money, I think was also really important. We just wanted to, to build the thing, test it, 
um, and see if it kind of stuck before we committed to, before I was asking him for any kind of financial assistance and whether he was kind of ready to commit. Um, so it was a bit of a slow burn. And I have to say that um, getting him involved um, really early on um, meant that he felt like he was part of the process. He felt like he could contribute. And a lot of the prototypes that we developed were black and white. I remember standing at the photocopier, remember those things, printing um, off, you know, prototypes. And I had this beautiful black string that I strung together, uh, these books. Um, so really early on, uh, really low fidelity. And it was just a really great way to engage him. Um, it spoke to him in a language that he understood. Um, so that was really important. Nothing too fancy, really simple kind of communication um, with him. And I would have to say just a chipping away at it, just a, um, a really slow burn at the start. And then mm. the money conversation and, and I guess the, the workbook, you know, publishing the book um, came, came a little while later. So um, finding somebody at a leadership level to advocate uh, yep. for you, uh, obviously that's helpful and you were lucky enough to have access to uh, somebody at that level. Uh, one, one question about this is, if you look back on this, what do you think made um, him or her uh, him. resonate yep. with this? Why, why did they um, engage? To be honest, I don't think, and he, he can correct me, I don't think he had seen a program or a, it's certainly a project plan or an aspiration of this kind of size and scale and dedication before. Um, he's worked for other organisations. He's come from IDEO. I mean, that's... I mean, they they do a great job at, at growth and development, but I guess uh, inside an organisation such as such as ANZ uh, or more on the client side, uh, he he hadn't really seen this um, this kind of work before or this sort of thinking, and and I guess he really believed in the opportunity. He was new new to role and very open minded about what was possible, um, but a, a shared passion as well is probably my third point. Um, really passionate about you know, not only embedding design, which is, you know, such a big term um, and, and loaded, you know, in at times, but really building this sense of community, you know, and he would say building a world-class community inside an organisation. So huge aspiration. Um, so I, I guess it was a little bit easier for what I was trying to sell in terms of uh, this idea of this uh, learning program. Um but he he knew that we needed to do something different to reach that aspiration of being world class and and building that community um, within site you know within our organisation. So that's not to say that uh, he was a hundred percent of a believer from from the first go, but. He certainly saw an opportunity um, to build something different, uh, to build something that would speak to designers, um, and he definitely resonated with, you know, this test and learn approach that we were taking um, to to seeing if this thing would even work. Mm. Yeah, um, and then what I'm hearing uh, or getting in between the lines is. Um, it's connected with his agenda. You were helping him to Absolutely. achieve the objectives that he probably was set out to achieve. And that makes it so much easier, like compared to yeah. your uh, conversation with HR, like they, they have a, di they had or have a different agenda and then it's really hard to get sponsorship. You have to find the person absolutely. who you can help achieve the thing that they yeah. want. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you raise a really good point. So it's really understanding what that business need is or what that strategic objective is. Um, I'm really grateful that part of our design strategy, um, part of our part of our vision is to build that world-class design community. And um, the chief design officer is a pretty smart guy and he knows that that doesn't come, you know, without work and that preparation and that dedication um, and really having design ops to enable um, building that community um, I, I think is is one step closer to achieving that. I might be biased, but um, mm. I think it's true. <laughs> I'm um, anything else with regarding to success and uh, factors that have contributed to success? Um, I think one of the things that we do really well is 
we get feedback um, throughout our learning program. Um, we have a pretty rigorous feedback process. Um, we do a really lovely uh, activity where we interview and film a lot of our designers and our stakeholders prior to the program starting. Um, and then 12 months later, um, we capture some testimonials. So it's really, it's really fulfilling to see where where people started on their learning journey and, and, and where they kind of end up in, in 12 months. And even for us, success could also mean, you know, I've improved a little bit, um, but I see, you know, more opportunities for myself. So even if the program doesn't 100% hit the mark, at least it's given them a little bit of a springboard um, to, to think about their growth and, and career a, a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that, that's a really that's a really great thing that we do as part of the program. And it's evolved. Um, as I mentioned, we started a you know, as a pilot, um, we had a very small amount of money. Um, we leveraged a lot of our um, partners as well. So a lot of our software partners ran um, workshops. Um, we used a lot of LinkedIn learning at the time. And so three years later, our budget has almost tripled um, and the program has evolved. So I think this year um, we're going to run I think it's 114 events. Last year we ran 80, almost 90 events. Um, and the first year we ran about 50 events. Um, so when we say events, they're sort of workshop sessions where you can kind of um, sign up for. Um, so yeah, it's, it's grown. Um, but one of the things also that has been incredibly successful is we've made it really easy for our designers. We've made it really easy. We put a program together. It's like running a festival. Uh, we put a program together all the times. We put educator information and we basically say, go to this website and register here. Yeah. We've made it really easy. Yeah. And, and, and uh, making it really easy is really hard. That's the thing. <laughs> That's right. That, that, it's a lot of work That's to make right. this easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Um, so yeah, we, we formed a working group, uh, so there's myself and five others, an incredible, um, passionate um, group of designers uh, that, that have come from the community. So one of the things that, uh, one, I guess an ambition of mine last year was thinking about how to grow the program and, and, and how to add more workshops and, and content. And I could have done it with our smaller team, um, but there was a lot of volunteers who, who wanted to help build the program and really believed in it. And what we've done in 12 weeks could have easily taken 12 months. So I'm really grateful mm. to them. And I think they've learned a, a little bit along the way as well. So it's been great. Yeah. So, so just to put this in into perspective, like you've been at it for at least three years, uh, maybe even yep. six, depending on how you count. You, you're dedicating yourself with a team of six people to this. Like it doesn't this doesn't just uh, fall out of thin air. Again, uh, I think yep. I'm trying to stress here that it is, it requires time, attention, dedication, intention. Um, so uh, um, a few questions that are still left on my mind about this. Um, right. Knowing what you know now, if you could start all over, let's say you move to the Netherlands to a different financial institution and they ask you to set up this uh, this thing, what would you do differently if you could start over? I would do what I'm doing now, um, which is I would stay much more focused on the things that matter. Um, and I would focus, try as best I could to focus on three things that are really gonna create impact. If I go back six years, um, you know, there was a task at hand. I needed to operationalize the team. I needed to, you know, think about how we work. I needed to think about tooling and processes and um, really getting the engine running. Um, but that took years um, to, to be able to, I guess, focus on, on, on kind of three key things. Um, so if I had my time over, um, I would... I guess set up the practice and and take what I've learned and set it up much faster. Operationalize, uh, get that engine running, keep the lights on uh, much quicker, um, and uh, be a bit more brave. I think um, spend sense. a lot of time, yeah. yeah, just trying to perfect those processes. Whereas, yeah, I probably should have been a bit braver back then. Um, 
but yeah, just just being a lot more focused. So thinking about yeah, what I mentioned before about what do the designers need, um, what do the business need, and how can design ops support that to deliver value. Uh, having that clarity uh, has taken me years, I would say. Um, so yeah, to, if I had my time over, I would think about uh, what's the most efficient way to operationalize this community so that I can um, really focus on uh, what designers the business uh, need and, and I guess the design ops function to really create value. Is, is it possible to be more efficient at the start or do you actually need the time to explore? Yeah, I, I think there's always ways. Um, I think leveraging the community more, um, working with other teams outside of design. So it's talked about so much, but really breaking down those silos. So really understanding how your risk function works, really understanding how finance works. You can run so much more efficiently. Mm. Um, I think I took a lot of things for granted uh, or didn't really understand coming into an organisation such as ANZ um, the importance of those partners or those enablers that sit outside of design. So I think that, um, yeah, to be more efficient, you need to take the time, absolutely, um, to to really understand your world and, and the context that you're in to ensure that design can be successful and the work that you're doing yeah, do, does have that impact, um, yeah, to, to be efficient. All right. Now, what's next? What's coming up? What's <gasps> on your, what's on your uh, bucket list? Okay, um, so uh, what is coming up? So we have just launched the learning program, um, which is great. Uh, so in a couple of months, we will start planning next year's learning program. Um, we are looking at uh, a mentor program, which is really exciting. Uh, ANZ have tried to, to have a mentor program, um, but we really see an opportunity, particularly in this remote context, to create connection. Um, our designers have told us that they'd love, yeah, whether it's mentoring or more peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences. So thinking about, um, you know, pairing experts with designers. Um, and the final thing is we're going to uh, hopefully publish version two of our workbook. Yeah. This little beast. Um, so we're looking to do that next. And uh, will that a workbook be available publicly? The vision was to always make it open source. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, uh, look, the workbooks have had a lot of interest over the years, which is which is really amazing. And um, yeah, it's it's fantastic to to see how it's evolved and uh, the feedback that we're getting, uh, and also the skills that are changing since we first launched the program. Um, so a really great example is one of our designers a couple of months ago said to me, oh, I've just joined ANZ and uh, I got a copy of the workbook because we give it to them uh, as part of their onboarding. And they said, it's interesting. It talks about facilitation, but it doesn't talk about remote facilitation. Have you thought about adding that as a skill? Like, absolutely. Um, so obviously the book was published uh, before the pandemic. So it's really interesting to think about what are those skills that are really going to sort of future-proof our designers, whichever way they work. So whether they are fully remote or hybrid, um, or we all kind of return to face-to-face -to -face, um, interaction. So uh, there's a whole lot of skills um, that will be added to the book. So currently the book is 126 pages. I'm envisaging it's going to be uh, a little bit thicker by the time we get to version two. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, we'll definitely share that one uh, when it's ready or when it's online, and maybe we can make it uh, version 3.0 into a collaborative right. uh, yep. thing from the entire community. Um, Michelle, sort of wrapping up, um, what do you hope is the one thing people will take away from our chat? I really hope that uh, this has inspired everyone on the call uh, to get under the hood a little bit around how design uh, works and I guess functions within a large organization. Uh, and I also hope that you walk away with a, more of an understanding of design operations, I guess what we do um, and how we deliver value um, to not just our design community, not just our chief design officer, but I guess ANZ more broadly um, when we're thinking about um, really you know, embedding design within organizations.
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, there you. are still so much uh, on my notes here that I would love to go over, but maybe we'll do a sequel episode someday. Uh, uh, sounds uh, Michelle, thanks for coming on and sharing this with the Service Design Show uh, community. I hope that we'll be able to create many more bridges between design ops and uh, our little community over here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Michelle and got something useful out of it. If you did, leave a short comment down below with your biggest takeaway. Thanks so much for watching to the Service Design Show and I look forward to see you in the next video.